This was when we had Eleanor Taylor. She was then the deputy picture editor of Time magazine. Um, when she came over, Mahfouz invited her to the press club, and it was his invitation. So then, then no, Time came. Yeah. No, no, everyone came. See, if that happened yeah. with us, if I invited uh, someone uh, in Nepal, the other people are just, oh, yeah, this is like a mild stuff. Okay. So this is, I mean, that's the thing about South Asia. We, we need a really huge crisis for the people to come <laughs> okay. together. Like in Pakistan, this, um, what's his name, uh, Cyril, mm. was given a, you know, he was not allowed to leave mm. the country, and he found out, and he wrote a big piece mm. in, the, in the Dawn, in the op-ed, and suddenly all the papers actually came together in solidarity. That would be, like, that would be really rare in well, it's rare in Bangladesh as well. The time I remember it happening was um, in the last days of Irshad when there was all this censorship. It started with them having blank spaces. Yeah. For, for, and then they stopped actually publishing mm -hmm. in protests. So for a large period of time, not a single newspaper came out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was all newspapers together. Yeah. We all, we have a very creative way of it. You know, dealing with censorship in our countries. I mean, we had the, the King Ganander School, for example, 2005. Two army majors would sit behind you and read the screen of the paper that's going to press. And the reason they were majors was because they needed English yeah. for us. For the other papers, they sent the junior <laughs> guys, you know, because they can they can read their body. But they would actually look at the screen, censor things, take that cartoon out, take that headline, change that on the color. fly. Yeah. Before we went to press. Okay. So we had to go to press with blank spaces. And then they came back the next week and said, you can't use blank spaces. So then we started putting gibberish on the page. <laughs> you know, just like random keystrokes. Yeah, yeah. And then they came back the next week and said, you can't do that either. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, you, have, you play cat yeah, and mouse. Yeah, sure. But that, that actually brings us to, let's go back. Uh, I mean, where was it, Manila, when we first met? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. IPDC. Yeah, that, that must have been 80s, right? Yeah, Talise, Tambuli Radio Project, right, yeah, things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tambuli then had its own um, offshoot in Nepal, which was Radio Sagarmata. Oh, Radio Sagarmata was Tambuli's? Well, no. Tambuli was Philippines, uh -huh. and IPDC backed a okay. brand new radio station. Uh -huh. Nepal had just come into democracy in 1990. But the radio spectrum was still being treated as government property. Uh -huh. And people like Bharat Koirala and other activists, they really lobbied for like four years. So it took four years of democracy to actually get parliament and the government to agree that the FM ban should be in the public domain. And so Radio Sagarmata then became the first licensed FM radio station, not government, in Nepal, and IPDC uh, supported it. I'm trying to think whether it was Radio Sagamatha or not, but there was, I remember being there when an antenna was being put up on the seat, rooftop of the Himal office, or the Panos office. Um, uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, we, we, we loaned them our roof. Yeah, uh, I remember being there, which I was yeah, photographing yeah. this whole because, thing. Because the Panos office was about six stories high, yeah, yeah, high yeah. on top, so it had that reach, yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Then, um, of course, then Bharat went on to get the Max Sai Award uh, for, for his work in lobbying for, um, you know, broadening the FM um, network in Nepal. And now we have uh, nearly 300 FM stations all over the country. And it's a really alternative voice. Uh. Well, we have community radio, for instance, but they, they uh, have their hands, arms yeah. tied completely. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at India the world's largest yeah. democracy, great long tradition of free press, and yet the FM band in India is totally under the iron fist of the government. The, I mean, they can broadcast any I mean, entertainment, but for news, it can only be the... Uh, all Maybe they should sing the news like you guys did. Yeah, we did that in 2005. Uh, not we, but uh, a radio station in central Nepal. They got so tired of the censorship of King Ganendra in 2005 that they waited four months and they said, well, we have nothing left to lose. And the directive from the royal government at that time was, you can only broadcast music, not news. So they started singing the news. I they had a duet in, <laughs> in, the, in the studio. And, you know, it would be not a love song, but it would be about what's happening politically all over the country. So that was the way they... So, you know, very creative ways of getting around the 
censorship? Uh, should we come to this? Because we here in Kathmandu at the Kathmandu Photo Festival, you will remember how long it's been when we've been trying all sorts of things, right. uh, pre-Panos, in fact, mm. uh, you know, with different people in different ways, trying to get it. Makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the I white have beard, the you have the white hair, so <laughs> between us, we're there. Uh, but um, it, it really is remarkable to see how mu how far Nepal has come in a relatively short time. Um, uh, I mean, sure, there was all that you know, gestation period, perhaps, but since Photo Circle and since, you know, well, what, say, the last five, ten years, it's been fairly dramatic. Yeah, and I think, um, looking back, I think what you've done with training Nepali photojournalists, journalists in your school in Dhaka, um, what we have done with panels, with uh, you know, uh, visual uh, workshops, of and of course we work with panels as well. On yeah, locations. and we thought at that time, well, you know, when is it ever going to change? You know, it's, it's, it's all so incremental, but it seems like it's incremental. It, it ultimately then reaches a threshold level, yeah. then it sort of erupts. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of your students are now, you know, active in this festival. Uh, they're bringing their creativity here. There's a new generation that has gone out to, to now learn. Um, so, and then uh, internet makes it all very sure. much faster now. You know, sure. uh, but there fun. is also, I think, a uh, fundamental shift, not only in terms of the work they're doing, but in the visual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Even in Nepal, you actually see many different voices, mm -hmm. uh, visual voices, if you like, yeah. Uh, yeah. telling stories in very different ways. and. Mm -hmm. that, a much more nuanced way of getting ideas across than you used to have. And the whole spectrum. You have yeah. people who do just pure like creative photography, mm -hmm. nature, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, portraits. Mm -hmm. And then you have the real activist type photojournalist who, who has a mission, you know, and he uses that medium to, to for the cause. And then and everything in between. One thing though which perhaps I mean this is something we had to go through. There was a time when uh, the Bangladesh Photographic Society, which was then the camera club, but a big, credible camera club, uh, was the entity we were involved with. Uh, the photojournalist community, both the Photojournalist Associ Association and the Photojournalist Forum, we had party politics even, even there. Uh, but they had a policy where if one of their members joined the Photographic Society, their membership would have been cancelled. Wow. So polarized, yes. yes. Exactly. Somewhat similar here, but uh, maybe not as bad. Yeah. But we've been able to overcome that, though. That is one of the things I'm hoping now. You have this very credible community of photographers doing good things, but the mainstream photojournalistic community hasn't really mm. either tapped into it or really taken advantage of it. Yeah. I feel a bit frustrated sometimes, uh, not just here but also elsewhere, where Although I'm not a professional photographer myself, I seem to be more interested in photography than the photographers. <laughs> and that's a bit of a dilemma. Like when you, like you have, let's say, James Natchewick coming to Nepal. So we use that opportunity to get everyone together and, and have a little workshop or, or a talk. And you really have to goad the photographers to come, you know. And it's, um, it's sometimes a bit frustrating. But I see now that there is a critical mass. And, and I think that then with all the associations, even if the associations are not speaking to each mm -hmm. other, at least they're, they're different voices yeah. and, and they, they'll take that medium forward. And that exposure I'm sure makes a difference. I mean, merely the fact that there are so many interesting people here in Kathmandu right now, uh, sure, many of the people taking advantage of it are people from India, Bangladesh. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't see too many from Sri Lanka, I'm not sure. Yeah, really yeah. Uh, it's a farther distance, I suppose, mm -hmm. but um, certainly that being there, and hopefully it will also be get picked up by media, uh, and there will be a general awareness mm -hmm. of that all. No, the, the panel you moderated, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the, this, this room mm -hmm. was full, I mean, there were about 200 exactly. people here, there were people sitting on the floor. Yeah. So uh, I think the interest is there now, uh, not just in Nepal, but regionally. And uh, my foray into it, well, in which we worked together, was the uh, conflict photographs. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, which started out as just one book, but it snowballed into a larger project, and and it just became spontaneously, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, an exercise in reconciliation, which was not planned. It just it just became. You know. So it just shows you that. I mean, for me, it was proof of the power of the picture and what it can do. What also struck me was, remember, when you came to Chobimala, and I think you were talking to Marcelo Brodsky, mm -hmm. and then uh, was uh, Jorge Villa Corte there at yeah, that time? Yeah, he was there. Yeah. So you were talking about the parallels between what was happening here and in Latin America. Chobimala actually opened my eyes, um, and, and I flew with Marcelo Brodsky, who's from Argentina, and he's done similar work with memory and photography. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, with the, and his his exhibition is at the Met this week yeah. in New York. Um, <clears throat> so I thought, wow. And we had thought, you know, when we did the book, that wow, we've done something really original. No one else has done this. But it seems across the world, in a post-conflict situation or a post-violence situation, journalists, photojournalists, come up with the same ideas about how to use the medium for uh, for reconciliation. And and so I saw Marshall Brodsky's work, uh, which is uh, Memoria. Where you know his brother was disappeared, yeah, and then he started yeah. collecting pictures. And his museum is inside the torture chambers and the execution chambers of the junta. It's amazing. Uh, then I find out that Chile has a very similar thing. Peru has a post Sendero Luminoso revolution, a very similar photojournalism exercise for peace. Um, and the and the most dramatic of all, and for me the most emotional, is the uh, one in Japan, in Okinawa, where. Um, there are these photographs of these uh, young women who committed mass suicide before the Americans invaded. Uh, and that museum is, is with the testimonies that the, that the women wrote while in that cave for months and months. Uh, and, and with their photographs all around it in that darkness, it's just very, very moving. So, so I've actually now collected that besides Nepal, we have all these other exercises. Where it's difficult, it seems, is where the conflict is ethnic where it's really between two ethnic groups, or it's a religious strife, or it's a sectarian separatist violence. It's interesting that uh, you're mentioning that in Sri Lanka, uh, at the height of uh, the fighting, there was a woman called Gajani, and she was a photographer for the LTTE. Oh. And she was smuggling out pictures to me, mm. and we showed it at Chubimala. Wow. Um, then, of course... The Sri Lankan embassy complained? No, they did. They probably didn't even know it. I mean, I, that's one of the things. Talking about embassies complaining, there was this. <laughs> oh yeah, we've our stories <laughs> yeah. about that. Uh, one, in our case, with Chobimala, it began with I think the first Chobimala. We had uh, a beautiful body of work by children from Shonagati. This is the uh, brothel in Kolkata. Mm, the kids yeah, yeah. Uh, have been taught photography, and they produced wonderful work, which we showed. Of course, the Indian embassy felt that that was not the right representation of India. <laughs> so they withdrew sponsorship Whoa. from the festival itself. We went on, uh, but mentioned it when we were interviewed. And this was published by, I think, Ananda Vader yeah. in Kolkata. So that got them riled up even yeah. further. And that led to me not getting a visa for many years to yeah. India. Yeah. But you had a run-in with the Chinese as well. Right? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, but that was interesting in the sense that, um, yeah, it is an embassy thing, but the embassy leaned upon our government to close down our show. So a foreign government being able to close down a show somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's yeah. diplomacy for you. Yeah, I think some of our governments are a bit sensitive about... Are we okay? Sure, you can go on. Can go on. Is it not like? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> this is part of it. I, I, on the way here, I was through Istanbul Airport, and suddenly there was really? power sh load shedding inside Istanbul Airport. Wow! Yeah. Well, you thought it was a cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when some, well, I just come from the airport, yeah, so yeah. it might well have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we both talked about photography playing the role that it has, and the incredible shifts that have taken place. Uh, how come? Even in Bangladesh, where we've been working for so long, uh, there really isn't uh, photographic education at a serious level, or, or visual literacy at a serious level. It comes from a Brahmanical culture, you know, where it's all about writing and text, and this whole definition of journalism being about text. So if you look at the newspapers, even today, you know, with all the technology available, it's all text heavy. And the picture is just an offshoot, uh, sort of an afterthought, 
and it's a postcard size thing. It's not just pictures, but even design. With all the technology available to us, even on the net with multimedia and digital storytelling, we're still doing text. And I think that that'll only change if journalism schools change. And for some reason, they're so rigid with their curriculum that it's... I would have thought differently in the sense that uh, if you look at Britain, for instance, when the independent newspaper came out, their strategy was to use photography Visual. to get market dominance. Mm. And they succeeded. They out of the blue, this newspaper comes up and just uses images so interestingly that it takes over the market share. And then it forced mm. oh, these old schools, the Guardians and Times and everyone else, to, because they, they had no choice. Got, they all got killed off by the internet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> Uh, but there's a very similar uh, thing, a parallel in India, in Calcutta in fact, where the Telegraph when it first came out in 1982 was this, this revolutionary new design, you know, like very well printed, excellent quality, great modular design, uh, and it just killed the statesman. The statesman never recovered from yeah. that. But then that's what I'm getting at. How come? And uh, purely from a business point of view, doesn't someone say, "Look, you know, here's a business opportunity for me. I will take it on." I think businessmen, in the industrialists who own media in our subcontinent, they are from the old school, and they have never understood visuals. Uh, for them, visual is television, and so some of them own television stations. But and also, they're not doing journalism for journalism. It's just yet another business they sure. have. And an insurance. Yeah and, yeah, and it's great for prestige. Like when you go to meet the president, you're not just there as an industrialist, you're a media baron. And that gives you weight. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So that's everywhere, in our country, in your country, everywhere. And, and that, that actually stops um, innovation. But I remember it was a Panos project we did in, in Dhaka where we invited photojournalists visual people, editors from the region, including Nepal. Uh, and we took over the Daily Star yeah, for one week. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that really played a pivotal role in the shift. Mm. It's not a great shift, but it is a shift mm. that has taken place. Mm. And that started from that one role, and perhaps that's the other thing to look at. There really isn't the concept of a picture editor right. either in the, in the newspapers. Right. Even yeah. we don't have it. Yeah. I'm the picture <laughs> editor, I mean, de facto. Yeah. And, but, you know, speaking about our paper in Nepali Times, I'm not a photographer, but our formula for Nepali Times when we started in 2000 was to have really, really good printing. So you could use photographs and do justice to them. So black and white or color pictures, but, but do it in a way that's almost magazine quality in a newspaper. Uh, and that, you know, was risky, but it really worked because that high quality printing yeah, brought, in the, apart, yeah. brought in the ads, brought in high paying ads. So they could add, we could actually yeah. charge a premium to print those ads in our paper. And then the advertisers saw the difference between the, yeah. the newsprint and the daily sure. broadsheets and in our uh, magazine newsprint. And so when, when you go for that quality, it's good for photojournalism. It's also good for the paper because you can make more uh, revenue. But it does something else as well. I think it also, in a way, nurtures the eye of the general public. Mm. People become, they respond to yeah. the visual possibilities. And I suppose once it becomes, uh, once the person on the street, once the punter wants it, mm -hmm. that is when it creates the pull effect uh, yeah. for that transformation to take place. But the next big challenge is to work on journalism schools, to, to get them to, be, to improve visual literacy, to add photography, photojournalism classes. Sometimes they have it, but it's in the fine art department, yeah. not in the journalism department. Well, and I know, for instance, in the Dhaka University, it's just one little module mm. stuck away somewhere, taught by someone who's not particularly qualified, in my opinion. But I, I don't think it's just about journalism. I think journalism per se needs to have a revamp. Oh yeah, totally. And, and I think the opportunity is now with uh, the internet. And the fact that you now have to train journalists not just in writing headlines and captions and ca you know um, text but also to train them in multimedia skills in, in to be versatile with all kinds of There's platforms. There's a guy called Dirk Halstead, he, he was a Time Magazine photographer on the presidential beat and then other things. He, he publishes something called The Digital Journalist mm. and there he describes the modern day photojournalist as the platypus. Oh. We have to lay yeah, eggs yeah, yeah. and give milk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
and be halfway between a reptile yeah, and a exactly. bird and a fish. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. no, that's the digital journalist, and now there's the mojo. Yes, the mobile course, yeah. journalist. Yeah. You know, really. So our competition now will now come from the citizen journalist who, with a mobile phone, can be at the right place at the right time, where we aren't. And therefore, we need to use our skills in a, in a much more versatile way, more creatively, and uh, and also it, it, the platforms give us that distributive reach, sure. which we didn't have before. Yeah, uh, is that something that is being taken on? I mean, uh, certainly now newspapers have their online forums and things like that, but at least in Bangladesh, one of the things we've created is the Rural Visual Journalism Network. Mm -hmm. So this is a group of, we, currently we have 43 correspondents wow. all across so Bangladesh. send you pictures by mobile. They, they produce, they use the iPod Touch, not even an iPhone, they, because it, an iPod Touch is a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. They use the iPod Touch to produce three to five minute video feeds. Wow. We've trained them to edit using iMovie on the phone itself, on the wow. iPod. So they produce complete packages and send us ready-made material, mm -hmm. which we then distribute. Ironically, Doshavelle publishes a story every week. Local media does not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we, we don't have anything like that here yet. But I think we really have to strive to make media also more inclusive. I think it's, it's, uh, it's dominated by a few voices, um, mostly male. Um, the, the marginalized groups are not represented. Uh, so the mainstream voice is the voice of the elite, and, and that needs to change. Uh, again, because of language and reach and accessibility issues, it's, it's the whole distribution network of media is dominated uh, by, the, by the traditional forces. Uh, talking of which, uh, we are just beginning something, taking off from the RVGN model. We're now producing a radio program of by women for women. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, it's, it's still at a pilot stage, let's see where that goes. Mm -hmm.